Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars video. Today we'll be dealing with a question that you guys have asked a ton of times, and that's why aren't micro jumps or very short tactical hyperspace jumps more common in Star Wars space battles? I mean, we see them in other universes. We've even seen them sometimes in canon, for example, at the Battle of Scarif, but we've never really seen a faction regularly use hyperspace jumps, and specifically we don't see ships for for example, jump from one place in a battle to another despite the obvious tactical advantages that that would offer. I mean, if you could freely jump a ship, you could totally break enemy formation or target vulnerable ships. So let's try to answer that question and we will stick in this case to Star Wars Legends only because Star Wars canon has just been really really wild with the rules of hyperspace and I just don't even want to guess how this question could be answered. That being said, even in Legends there is a good deal of inconsistency here so I'm going to use some assumptions while also preferencing specific sources that I think are more influential. So as many of you know the Thrawn trilogy actually deals with Grand and Admiral Thrawn's use of precision hyperspace jumps, although not full use as we postulated at the beginning of the video where he's jumping ships in and out of battle. However, this is sort of a situation where the exception proves the rule and we can see through Thrawn's use of various tactics the beginning to some of the limits of hyperspace travel. So here's a quote from Heir to the Empire. Conventional military wisdom frowned on this business of picking a spot just outside the target system as a jumping off point. It was considered dangerously easy for one or more ships to get lost on the way to such a rendezvous, and it was difficult to make an accurate hyperspace jump over so short a distance. So this is one element. Apparently longer hyperspace jumps allow for some sort of correction, or just generally because of the nuances of hyperspace travel are just more accurate, and perhaps that's because of the extreme acceleration associated with entering hyperspace, and also that the travel time is so short and thus the potential for error is very, very wide. We see in Heir to the Empire that Thrawn literally counts to 75 and then they exit. And the only real reason why he is able to perform these really short jumps is simply because of how well practiced and disciplined the Chimera's crew is. However, this is only part of the equation and misses a whole lot of the potential difficulties. And we're talking things like accuracy that we'll get to in just a moment. But if you look at the fact that short hyperspace jumps are more difficult, then it makes sense why micro jumps wouldn't be common. Common. I mean, even from a couple of minutes away, things in a Star Wars space battle would change pretty significantly. But that sort of need to get the distance as small as possible is sort of inherent in the idea of a micro jump, especially a tactical one. So there are many other reasons why tactical hyperspace jumps are very, very difficult, even with an incredibly disciplined and practiced crew like that of the Chimera. Let's talk about them, and I do have quite a few here. First of all, it's very difficult and sometimes impossible to make hyperspace space jumps near stars or planets, and of course, that's where Star Wars space battles often happen. At the Battle of Borlias, for example, when the New Republic needed to jump in a ship, only the Mon Mothma, which was outside the star's gravity well, was available. Now this is a fairly consistent rule in Star Wars Legends, the being able to jump near a massive object has been treated much less consistently in canon, but it is definitely a consideration, and it also limits how far you can progress into battle. If the fleet is fighting in atmosphere, well then, you shouldn't be able to jump there, because you'll be pulled out far before you reach your destination. Another big issue though is one of accuracy, and this ties in very closely with the first point. I don't think there's really been a good Star Wars legend source that ties the accuracy of a hyperspace jump to the length of the jump, nor do I think necessarily we know how accurate hyperspace jumps are as a rule. Can they vary by thousands of kilometers, dozens, we're not really sure. Going back to the first point, some of this does seem to be due to crew technical ability. Again, if we look at the outbound flight, for example, Thrawn is able to make micro jumps which are quite precise with his Chiss crew. Despite the fact that someone says, and I quote, you can't hit the side of the Senate building with a 
micro jump. Thrawn's ability here though is treated as exceptional as in he might be one of the only people in the galaxy, at least someone who's not force sensitive, to be able to coax this sort of pure efficiency out of his crew. And this is a best case scenario, not in the heat of battle, where you have to avoid ships or where you have to jump next to a moving ship. Even Thrawn knew the limits to this sort of movement and he employed a genius strategy known as the Thrawn Pincer. Basically, he would use an interdictor cruiser to create a hyperspace bubble, which is what interdictor cruisers do, which could then be used to accurately define the edge of a hyperspace vector. Once you hit the edge of the interdiction bubble, you would revert to real space. So if you want to broadside a Golan platform, for example, as Thrawn did at the Battle of Coruscant, you extend the bubble just to that Golan platform, then you have a ship come in at a vector, and it will be ripped out far more accurately than it could otherwise with its own computer and crew. It actually makes me think that ships should try to carry some sort of hyperspace buoy with interdiction capabilities so that backup fleets could arrive more accurately, but maybe that's just not possible. Even still, the Thrawn Pincer has a lot of limits. First of all, it only helps with the exit point. It doesn't make the actual jump into hyperspace any easier. And this is the next major hurdle. Hyperspace calculations take a lot of time. I'm talking several minutes, even if you're jumping across a well-known hyperspace route and you have a very fast navigational computer. So most hyperspace travel in the galaxy takes place along dedicated hyperspace routes, which have been discovered by explorers and which are generally free of debris and stellar objects and which you can travel safely. The start and end points for all of these hyperspace routes are stored in computers and are constantly updated because of the movement of the galaxy. If you're making a micro hyperspace jump then there's a lot more difficulty here. First of all your actual end point might not have an actual indexed coordinate like you can't just look up the position of a random spot in space like you could look up say Coruscant at least not unless you have some sort of ship there providing you with the information. What's more, unless you're very lucky, you might not be able to travel down a hyperspace route, so there's no guarantee that you could make this jump without hitting something else, whether during transit or coming out on the other side. Another issue is that if you're in battle and you want to make the micro jump, you'd probably have to use extreme amounts of energy, and you may even have to maintain a heading so that the computer can make its calculations, so you'd be fairly vulnerable. So just sort of to summarize, short hyperspace jumps were already very difficult, and this is jumps where we're traveling within a solar system, that itself is difficult. However, even in the best condition, hyperspace space accuracy is not guaranteed, and that's both in stopping distance and, I would argue, actual placement. You can sort of coax that accuracy out with techniques like the Thrawn Pincer, but that still has several limitations, including the ability to actually make the jump and not be blocked by stellar objects and having the time to make the hyperspace calculations. And there's also just the element of impossibility. That situation we were talking about with Thrawn earlier, where he was in hyperspace for seven 76 seconds still saw him travel three thousandths of a light year which might not sound like a whole lot of distance but is actually 30 billion kilometers in the black fleet crisis we have that a ship which is light hours away is considered too close for a safe hyperspace micro jump so yeah, there's lots of reasons, and I hope you guys have a better idea of how hyperspace works after this video. Generally, the rules aren't super consistent, and they seem to be sort of made up as people are going along. Timothy Zahn, I think, has a very clear idea for how he would like hyperspace to work, and I think generally that's what I prefer, and which I find to be the most influential. Speaking of, we have a kind of interesting hashtag ask a question of the day from Obex, who asks, what if the Spirit of Fire joined the Rebel Alliance? And the first issue with that would be is that Slip space drives in Halo are much, much, much slower than hyperdrives in Star Wars, so they would immediately need to get that refitted, but there would also be the issue of the Spirit of Fire not having any shielding, which would make it a pretty easy target in any sort of space battle. However, small-scale artificial intelligence like the one present on the Spirit of Fire in Serena isn't really something that the Star Wars universe has, at least not to the same degree, where AI can sort of control things on a massive level and plan out grand strategy. 
though I think the ship itself would probably be trashed or used as some sort of mobile base far away from the action, while anything on board like the nukes or the Spartans or the AI would be brought into rebel service and probably distributed wherever they would make the most sense. I have to say Spartans would probably be the perfect shock troopers for the Rebel Alliance. Maybe I should do a video on that. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And if you have a future video you'd like me to cover or a future question you'd like me to cover at the end of a video, include it with the hashtag AskEck. Anyway, that's all for now, guys. Have a good one and may the force be with you.